Hello everyone, this is uh, Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 46. The themes today are our schools safe and uh, hopefully a little better understanding and discussion on risk masks in the three C's. So in Nebraska, how are we doing? Well, we're uh, kind of holding steady. We're not getting that much better. We're not getting much worse. The other states are displacing us from our top five, not because we got any better, because some of the rest of them are getting that much worse, unfortunately. Uh, across Nebraska, it's a little mixed. Lancaster County, we're about 30 to 35 per 100,000, which is too high. Uh, uh, Douglas Sarpy County, Omaha is about 40 per 100,000. They were a little higher. Hopefully this is a downward trend for them. Uh, rest of the state outstate Nebraska is at 56 per 100,000, so it looks like they may be following in the footsteps of South Dakota and North Dakota, unfortunately, so hopefully things will slow down a little bit out in outstate Nebraska. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we're headed toward uh, exceeding our hospital capacity potentially, and so if you look back, uh, like we've talked about previously, some updated numbers, you know, hospitalizations follow a uh, peak prior file uh, coronavirus rates by about three weeks. So if we look three weeks back at 262, uh, we just crossed 436 hospitalizations uh, here yesterday. Uh, if we project forward based on those numbers, we're looking at somewhere between 700 and 800 hospitalizations in another three weeks. Uh, and at what point does this start becoming kind of a burden on our hospitals and start burning out our nursing staff? And so this is, uh, I guess, one of my biggest worries right now. Uh, another way to look at it, New York Times does a pretty good job of uh, putting a lot of these all together at the same time, and so you can see the re report case reports starting to rise in Nebraska through September into October. You see the hospitalization rate three weeks later, uh, end of October, early October starting to head up, and of course then you see the fatality rates coming up in mid-October. And that's why people kind of keep messing this, is they don't realize that, yes, this follows, this follows this, and, and nobody is looking at the time lag here. And so unfortunately our, our death rates in Nebraska are going to start going up quite a bit too in the next next month unfortunately. So we'll talk about school safety and so uh, lots of, of angst in the community about was it still safe to have our schools open and so there were some uh, guidelines pushed out uh, this summer, uh, one by the UNMC College of Public Health that I was uh, participated in. Uh, these were based on the best evidence we have at, had at the time which has changed substantially. So in this and uh, this is per, per million not per hundred thousand but if we just express in hundred per thousand they were saying red, red or we, maybe we shouldn't have school was five per hundred thousand. Uh, Harvard came out with its own group. Uh, the, the UNMC group was looking at what uh, successful countries had done. I think the Ar Harvard group took more of a mathematical approach to it and, and used the theory to say, well, maybe up to 25 per 100,000 might be okay. So their thresholds were a bit higher than ours. Uh, then they uh, they also did uh, have some tipping points where they did they even went so far as to say stay at home orders and when you're in the red. Uh, however, uh, I don't think that's the case for Nebraska. The, uh, the Harvard folks, of course, they're in Boston, New York, Northeast, where your commute light look like this. This is my commute to work. This is safe no matter how high things get. So I actually don't think Nebraska ever needs a stay at home order or a shelter in place order because we live like this, not like this. And so I always have to look at context just because it was produced in the Northeast doesn't mean it applies to Nebraska. Uh, but still, you know, what, what, what is the, the upper limit of what should be safe? And of course it read they thought in Harvard, but this again is back in July and a lot has changed since then. Uh, because of those two different thresholds, if you go to the Healthy Nebraska site, we have both the UNMC thresholds and the Harvard thresholds. This does tend to track closer to the risk dials used by some health departments and a lot of national sites. Uh, but as I said last night in the school board meeting, uh, this is a, a method of conveying risk. It is not a light switch that's an automatic. Uh, and the reason it's not an automatic is because we've learned a lot more. Uh, and so this article I discussed a few weeks ago, uh, schools aren't super spreaders. It should have been more accurate to say instead schools with medication, mitigation measures aren't super spreaders. We do know that schools were super spreaders when they didn't have kids wearing masks. Uh, so there were some uh, well-publicized outbreaks over the summer in Israel as well as some others in other states like Georgia uh, where we do know that schools were super spreaders. But when mitigation measures are in place, it does not appear that schools are super spreaders. Uh, and so this article out of NPR last week that came out that are the risks of reopening schools exaggerated, I think the risks were there. I think what was underestimated was how much the mitigation measures would work. Uh, and so now the, the concern is, is at what point are we too high? Because what we are also starting to see is that there are risks of not having kids in schools. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as local pediatricians and the pediatrician quoted in this article, uh, that we're really starting to see the negative impacts of school closures on kids. And so we have to balance those two against each other. It's not a risk versus versus a benefit, it's a risk versus a risk. 
Uh, another article that did come out that I thought was very well written is uh, this Polysa Lab article out of uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Again, kind of summarizing things that essentially we do know that overall children are not as much at risk of any severe infections, uh, no more so than influenza. And actually, if you look at the the, uh, the risks for influenza and coronavirus, they're pretty comparable in children. To completely not the case in adults, though, unfortunately. But for kids, the risk is not there uh, in the same way. Uh, we also know that, that, that we keep finding that younger children, although Although yes, they can get infected and yes, they can spread it. They're not as efficient as spreading it. And so K through eight schools are probably much safer than high school, for example, uh, which is one of the reasons that here in Lincoln, we still do not have all 100% of kids in high school and still have the AB schedule. Uh, K through eight is much safer, although uh, teens seem to act more like adults in terms of spread. Uh, a couple other things they noted is that yes, schools are opening safely when when uh, when low levels of community transmission there should not shouldn't be much of a problem there. Uh, but we're also seeing that it looks like we may be able to open schools when there's moderate levels of transmission, and so that's a good thing to hear that the mitigation measures are more sexual than thought. And most of the school associated transmission is not happening in the school; it's happening outside of the school because of the things happening around the school, or it's the poor adherence to masking protocols. Uh, and that's exactly what we found here in Lincoln, actually. So we did have our few, first few cases that appear to be school spread. Uh, and so there was a press conference uh, a couple days ago and, uh, and a report and press release put out in the paper. Um, there were four possible areas. One was a high school student eating lunch outside of the school. One was inside of the school. Uh, we do know that lunch is one of the high risk areas. Uh, we had a couple staff members who were sharing an office space and not wearing the mask when they, they were together and five mass st staff members in one school eating lunch together uh, in close proximity without a mask for more than 15 minutes. And so it, it's more people sort of letting their guard round and down and also there is you know there is it is the the eating is probably the highest risk thing uh, but to have only a few outbreaks like this out of 30 to 40,000 kids for uh, probably close to 100 days of school uh, this is actually not a surprise to any of us uh, yes there is some risk but it's not a huge risk and the school decision is a risk versus a risk. And so there are some very severe risks of not having kids in schools, and those need to be balanced against this. Uh, one, of course, is the educational losses that kids might suffer by not being in school. Uh, the mental health concerns, which are, I'm hearing a lot of this from uh, family physicians and pediatricians about kids of the anxiety levels created, and they do benefit from that social interaction in school. Of course, we have problems with access to healthy food with a school lunch program for low-income students if they're not in school. Uh, there's also the needs of working parents, which are also very big. And of course, school structure may actually decrease overall community spread. So even if you had some school in spread, it spread in school, the alternative of kids not being in school, especially your high school kids, might actually be worse. So yes, there is some risk by having those kids in high school, but they may be uh, less responsible without the structure of school. Another moral argument that I can have concerns are is should children bear the burdens of bad adult behavior? The reason we're in this situation is not their fault. It's, it's us adults not doing what we should be doing in bad leadership across the country. So kids shouldn't be bearing most of those burdens. We should be. Um, the, the key though is that, that there are layers of risk. Nothing is 100% perfect, but we are finding that these layers of risk, which are in place in our schools here in Lincoln, and, and I know most across the state, having these layers in the Swiss cheese model is, is very effective. Cloth mask, by far the most important thing, any three to six feet distance. Uh, occupation and ventilation. So we do have a reduced occupation because uh, about 20% of our K through eight kids are not, they are opting for remote because they have high risk or other risk conditions, high schools AB, and then also ventilation. We benefited in Lincoln because of our, our uh, indoor air quality projects. We have three air changes per hour. And then hand washing, cleaning, disinfecting. These three are the most important. These are important too, but these are the big ones. Uh, and so all these things do uh, add together and do reduce risk, uh, reduce risk substantially. Uh, the question though, for my, my worry right now is how high is too high and how will we know that we hit it? Uh, and the, our biggest problem in Nebraska, I see, is we still do not have any access to any surveillance testing for K through 12 schools. Uh, this is a problem in Nebraska and, and, well, nationally. We have no testing strategy nationally. We have no testing strategy in the state of Nebraska. We have no good testing strategy even locally in Lincoln. We do need a, a rational way to start looking at how we should be using some of our testing. And one of those is to start doing some monitoring in some K through 12 schools so we can figure out what is that level of community spread where it would become too high risk. Is it 2,500,000? Is it 40? Is it 60? We don't know because we're just not testing. We're having to wait for uh, contact tracing to figure us out. We should be able to do And we could do this. And other countries have been doing this uh, for five months now. Uh, this is probably my biggest area of frustration is that we've made no progress despite asking for this for the last month. 
there was also, of course, some change in the CDC guidance. Uh, this really is not as big a change as people realize. Uh, they thought it was a 15-minute exposure. Essentially, they're saying, well, yeah, but three five-minute exposures also could mean the same thing. That's not a huge change. And again, uh, there's nothing magic about 15 minutes like there's nothing magic about six feet. So there were some schools that had the mistaken assumption that there was something magic and we're moving kids at 14-minute intervals. Uh, you're totally missing the point there. It's, it's, a, it's a, not a smooth light switch where it's either zero risk versus 100% risk. It's a gradation. And you have to pick some uh, uh, cut off sometimes and three, six feet and 15 minutes are somewhat arbitrary below, you know, being at four feet and 12 minutes is not a guarantee. It's all layers of risk. Uh, the other thing that's coming out lately and, and that it does appear that the plane flights are safer than we thought, mainly because of their air exchanges. They, I think, have read as much as uh, an air exchange every six minutes. So as long as people wearing masks, uh, that'll be effective. The unfortunate thing is that when they pass out food service, are people using that as an excuse to keep take their mask off and leave it off, which is the problem I'm seeing at restaurants and coffee shops and bars. When I've seen them, people seem to think that as soon as they order a drink and put it down on their table, they can put their mask on and let, just leave it on the table. No, that is not a safe way to approach. You can take the mask off to take a drink or to eat, but other than that, you should have it back on again. And so I do not feel that most coffee shops, bars, churches, and restaurants are safe if they're not being good about their mask adherence. Uh, we need to take a lesson again from the Japanese, like I've said uh, since May, basically. Uh, they've figured it out. They have high degrees of mask adherence, and they use the closed spaces, crowded places, close contact settings. That, combined with, a little, with some good contact tracing, made them by far one of the best countries as far as their response to coronavirus. And it's shown in their economy. And so there's some economic studies coming out showing that the Asian countries that did a good job are doing much better with their GDP growth than all the countries who are doing a horrible job like us. Uh, and so it wasn't the public health versus uh, the economy. The way to improve your economy was to do good public health, and we still keep forgetting that. Uh, the other problem I see is the directive health measures are directly contradicting this. So here we talk about the three C's in our directive health measures, and then put in our direct health measures things that directly contradict the three C's. We have no reduce in, in capacity here. There's nothing about six feet of spacing. There's nothing about wearing a mask in any of these places. Just because you only have eight people at a table versus 10 makes uh, frankly no difference, honestly. And so unless we're wearing masking in these situations, these are still high risk places to be. Uh, there's nothing about these directive health measures that I see that actually follows the three C's and would be effect, uh, be a, a change our trajectory right now. Uh, and again, it's not just those, but at, at people uh, just doing the things in their homes. And we're, so we're still seeing that a lot of these multifamily birthday parties, guys having a beer, video games, play dates with not people just frankly not following the mask of the three C's, uh, continue to have large degrees of spread. Um, so DHMs need to be more explicit about masks. Uh, you, need, you still need to wear your mask while you're in the restaurant, while you're in the bar, while you're in the coffee shop, while you're at a wedding or in church. Yes, you can take it off to take a drink or to take a bite of eat, but you need to put it back on when you're having your conversation. Three to six feet applies only if you're not talking very loudly, but in all these situations, you're going to be probably talking loudly, singing, cheering, whatever you're going to do. Uh, that six feet is not enough in that situation. Uh, and like uh, Dr. Khan said last last week, uh, we do not, the, the virus doesn't decide, the virus de literally can't move without us. We're the ones moving the virus. We need to change our behavior. Uh, so avoid the herd. Uh, it looks like, uh, unfortunately, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana are following the Barrington Declaration. Uh, unfortunately, they'll be our guinea pigs to see how bad it really gets uh, here in the next few weeks. But just because they're doing it doesn't mean you need to do it. So please avoid the herd. Wear a mask. Keep your distance. Follow the three C's and do it for real. Uh, it's going to be harder to stay outside, but do your best and wash your hands. So hopefully this is helpful to you. The, like I say, the, uh, previously, this is a disclaimer. It's my opinions, not necessarily everybody else. And, the, uh, and all of these uh, videos are on the healthylincoln.org website uh, if you want to look at them further.